Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Way Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 15th of July, 2021. All right, everyone, we have a lot to get through today, so I'm just going to get right into it. Uh, I d actually, just before I do that, I did a live AMA with Justin Bram today on his YouTube channel. So if you didn't get to check that out live, I haven't watched it yet. I'll link it in the YouTube description. You can go check it out here. Um, it was a really fun conversation, about an hour's worth of questions from both Justin and the audience, and we covered a, a lot of different topics. So, I mean, I obviously recommend going and checking it out, watching it or listening to it. And I also recommend subscribing to Justin's YouTube channel because he does a bunch of different uh, things within the... Um, kind of like Ethereum space. He does a bunch of different guides on how to, things like how to earn yield on, on your on your like stable coins and how to use various DeFi apps. So if you're newer to the ecosystem, definitely go check out Justin's videos because uh, he, he gives a great overview of various protocols on there. All right, so the Twitter thread that got the most attention today on Twitter was this one from Jackson Palmer. Now, for those of you who don't know who Jackson Palmer is, he is the, uh, I guess, creator or co-creator of Dogecoin. Now, I don't, think that should bestow any kind of like importance on him. I mean, I was going through the quote tweets to this thread that he put together and people were like, you know, this guy's the creator of Dogecoin, you should listen to him. And I just thought to myself, I'm like, what, why, what, why? Like, he, like for, for those who aren't aware, to create Dogecoin, all Jackson did was fork Bitcoin's code base, change a few variables and kind of launch it with like a, a dog token, essentially, like a dog, a picture of Doge on, on kind of like the token's logo or the coin's logo. So he didn't really do much. And after that, he didn't really do much in the crypto ecosystem. He made some videos on YouTube before he kind of like deleted them and kind of deleted his channel and went off Twitter for a while. But he came back today with this thread. Now, the TLDR, as I kind of tweeted here, was that Jackson hates capitalism. Now, I just put this out as like a bit of fun. I mean, I have obviously more points to kind of like what I said here, and I've got like more things I want to say about his thread. But just a bit of background on Jackson, he is pretty openly anti-capitalist in general. And this this thread pretty much captures that. He doesn't believe that capitalism is the best system we have for, I guess, like creating and managing economies, which is a fine belief to have. I have no issue with that. But you know, if you're not sticking to the facts, that's when I start having issues. And I think that Jackson's thread here, essentially, he starts it off, uh, and it's kind, of, it's quite like bombastic. Like he's going for that kind of effect where uh, that he can get that virality, and it has gone viral. I mean, look at the amount of engagement on this tweet; it's absolutely insane. Um, and he got what he wanted, I think, out of this thread. But I want to kind of just hit on a few points that he brought up, and why I kind of like completely disagree with him on on numerous things here, and why I think that while while he may be right about how he's describing some parts of the crypto ecosystem, he's also attributing um, you know way too much negativity to it. But also, you could attribute these points that he's brought up to basically the entire traditional finance system as well as crypto I mean, and, and most systems in general. Like, it, it feels like he kind of um, put this together because he obviously has a bias against crypto. I'm going to say that he also has a bias because he missed out on making any sort of money from Doge. He's notoriously made pretty much nothing from Doge. And as much as he'll probably say, oh, that doesn't affect me or like, I don't really care. Of course you care. If you missed out on making that much money um, and you missed out on, on kind of like, I guess, embracing it and, be and being known for actually embracing kind of like the meme and embracing kind of your cre creation, uh, of course you're going to be upset. It's, it's. I mean, it reminds me of like, imagine like you have a son and then you leave for whatever reason because you don't want to raise the son. And then the son goes on to, to be like world famous, you know, multimillionaire, whatever. And then you come back and you're like, you know, you're my son. I expect something from you sort of thing. And then you get pissed off if they won't give you anything. It's kind of the same thing. I feel like Jackson left his creation. He just left it to rot because he, he was ashamed of what he did for whatever reason. And now he's, he kind of like hates crypto in part because of that. But I want to hit on his actual kind of points here. And I just wanted to give a background on Jackson because he's been out of the space for quite a while. And a lot of newer people won't actually understand where he's coming from. But I think it's coming from a place of essentially deep, bias against crypto. Obviously, I'm coming from the other end of the spectrum where I, obviously my life is dedicated to to Ethereum and crypto. Um, but I feel like I, can, I, I at least for what I'm about to talk about, I'll be able to separate kind of my bias from that. Not totally, but as much as I as much as much I can. So anyway, I'm going to get into what he said. So he started off the thread by saying, I'm often asked if I will return to cryptocurrency or begin regularly sharing my thoughts on the topic again. My answer is a wholehearted no, but to avoid repeating myself, I figure it might be worthwhile briefly explaining why here. Now, I won't read the whole thread out 
but the first kind of tweet or second tweet in the thread is essentially his his core problem with crypto, where he says, after years of studying it, I believe the crypto cur- that cryptocurrency is an inherently right-wing, hyper-capitalist technology built primarily to amplify the wealth of its proponents through a combination of tax avoidance, diminished regulatory oversight, and artificially enforced scarcity. He actually manages to say, say a lot in just this one tweet, so I'll applaud him for that. But I think that what he's doing here, he's attributing some parts of the cryptocurrency community to everything. He's generalizing, essentially. You can generalize about anything if you want to. You can go to a country and say the the most extreme supporters or the most extreme people in that country are representative of the entire country's population. You can do that. You can extrapolate if you want, but you'd be wrong to do that. Just like I think Jackson is wrong to say that um, all of cryptocurrency is inherently right wing. Just like from anecdotal experience, I know so many people in the Ethereum ecosystem that are so far not so far from being right wing. It's it's insane. Like I I, I wouldn't say that like they're totally left wing or totally right wing. A lot of them are sitting in the center. A lot of them don't even want to get involved in these kind of pol- politics or anything like that. Um, but I have noticed like personally that a lot of these quote unquote right wing kind of people or people who ha- who have those kind of views, not that they're bad views or anything like that. And like he's he's framing it as if being right wing is a bad thing or whatever. I'm not going to comment on the politics of it and you know i don't really I, i'm personally i'm i'm more like a, a, a centrist like i don't really i don't even like to, to ascribe to any of these kind of things but anyway i think where you'll find a lot of those kind of like extremist views and the hardcore views is in the bitcoin community uh and you know you you guys all know what i'm talking about like the bitcoin maximalists and things like that those are extreme views and maybe that's what he's he's saying when he says inherently right wing um yeah, I, I'm. You know, he didn't really kind of, I guess, expand on that there. But that's, I think, what he's attributing it to. Now, if you look at Bitcoin as representative of the entire space, that's just completely wrong. I mean, look at the Ethereum community, for example. We have some pockets where there's some kind of like hardcore uh, people that are in there and whatever, but. I would say that generally Ethereum's community is nothing like that at all. Uh, nothing kind of like those those kind of like extremist views. And then he goes on to say hyper capitalistic technology. I mean, yes, in a way it is uh, because it's like very unregulated. It embraces capitalism at its core. Uh, you know, we, we embrace like uh, things like the best ideas win. We embrace uh, kind of like the market regulating things rather than, um, you know, I guess, legal regulators kind of regulating things. Uh, And that's all well and good. And there's good and bad things to that. Obviously, scams proliferate because there's no real kind of like regulation there. There will be eventually, I'm I'm sure of it. But right now, there kind of isn't. And that's just the trade-off. That's It's kind of like saying that the internet is is hyper-capitalistic because of the fact that anyone can build whatever they want on the internet. And, you know, it's kind of really hard to stop things. I mean, you know, governments around the world haven't even been able to stop file sharing and of copyrighted materials. They've been able to hamper it a little bit but it still exists and it still you know proliferates so i think there's that aspect to it and also the way he says here built primarily to amplify the wealth of its proponents through a combination of tax avoidance diminished regulatory oversight and artificially enforced scarcity i mean tax avoidance it happens in every single industry i mean like there, there there's a thing called cashies or cash jobs here in australia where tradies or tradespeople will go and do uh, cash-based jobs and not declare any of that income that's a huge economy in australia and i'm sure it happens in other places around the world then there's tons of restaurants who do this i mean tax dodging happens everywhere like criticizing crypto for for kind of tax avoidance is in my opinion really silly because it happens everywhere and i'm not trying to say that this is what about ism but if you're trying to make an argument against crypto specifically then this is kind of a weak argument in my mind and then saying diminished regulatory oversight well i mean the traditional finance is regulated up to wazoo and it's still shady as hell like seriously the only reason why we see a lot of these hacks and rug pulls happen in real time is because the entire crypto ecosystem is transparent the traditional finance system, we hear about money laundering, scams, massive things that destabilize the economy only years down the line. I mean, think about the subprime mortgage crisis that happened in 2008. That was like 20 years or something worth of um, worth of things kind of building up to that point where if we had a transparent system, we can actually see what was going on. We, will, we would have been able to monitor that and catch that before it happened. So again, I think that this diminished regulatory oversight is actually not a big deal because we have that transparency. And I think that regulators are going to come in time and they're going to, they already do regulate the, the fiat on ramps and stuff like that. And all these blockchains, except things like Monero and Zcash, I guess, but they're not really used. I'm talking about like Ethereum and Bitcoin mostly. They're transparent as hell. Like, 
you can't you you can kind of hide yourself somewhat, but like most of the time, uh, people don't do that. And there's uh, chain analysis tools that governments and and regulatory bodies use to kind of find people uh, and, and kind of like I guess regulate the industry and, and catch them for taxes. And then finally, he says artificially enforced scarcity. Now, I mean, this is kind of. I don't even know what to say about this, like artificially enforced scarcity to create wealth. I mean, sure, like uh, there's, there's scarcity within crypto. It is something that is obviously very coveted. We have it coming to Ethereum with 1559. That's a big part of it. Bitcoin obviously has a tide cap and stuff like that. But I don't know why this is a, a, a negative thing. Like I don't, I don't really get that. There's plenty of scarce assets in the real world already. Does Jackson have a problem with those assets? I don't know. And artificially enforced, I mean... Not necessarily, like Bitcoin has been the same since inception. Ethereum's issuance policy is there to, I guess, um, uh, make sure the, the network is secure and, and so that we can keep paying for security, even if fees are low and things like that. So yeah, I mean, as I said, Jackson managed to say a lot in this tweet, but I really just think that a lot of his points here are lacking complete nuance and also apply to pretty much like all industries that touch money at the end of the day in, in a big way. So there's that. And then, I mean, there's a bunch of other points here. I don't want to harp too long on about this, but I got asked to kind of cover this and, and give my my general thoughts here. But essentially, I believe that every part of this tweet thread applies um, equally, if not more, to traditional finance. And if you're using an argument against crypto, uh, like these arguments against crypto, or, or things like but like saying, um, despite he says here, despite claims of decentralization, the cryptocurrency industry is controlled by a powerful cartel of wealthy figures. I mean... The chains themselves are decentralized, like Ethereum and Bitcoin. They're not controlled by power of wealthy figures. Uh, good luck trying to buy your way into a, a protocol change on Ethereum or Bitcoin. It's not going to happen. So, I, I mean, this decentralization and, and kind of like harping on about it, things not being decentralized because of these uh, powerful cartel of wealthy figures, that can apply to the apps on Ethereum. I mean, we, we saw what happened with uni governance recently. But you have to kind of say that. You can't just generalize. Like, I hate when people do this, when they generalize for this kind of effect. And... You know, there's a lot of people who hate crypto that do this and they all do the same thing. They generalize. They see one kind of like little piece of crypto and usually they'll see the bad pieces because that's what the media likes to cover and they'll generalize it and they'll kind of apply it to everything. And obviously, that doesn't just happen in crypto. It happens everywhere. And it really does frustrate me because as someone who's a truth seeker and likes to kind of like, um, you know, stick to the truth, stick to the facts, I really hate this post-truth world that we're in where people will believe anything as long as it's on some, some kind of like media outlet. I really hate that. But anyway, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole and there's a bunch of other things he says here um, like he says, cryptocurrency is like taking the worst parts of today's capitalist system, corruption, fraud, and equality, and using software to technically limit the use of interventions, audits, regulation, taxation, which serve as protections or safety nets for the average person. Uh, hello, which serve as protections or safety nets for the average person. I mean... I am not a fan of most financial regulations. I don't think they actually do this. What I think financial regulations do is they actually benefit the wealthy more than anything. Because think about the things that average people can do uh, with their money. They can gamble it all away. You can literally gamble as much money as you want. No one's going to stop you. The casino might stop you, but you can go to another casino and do it. The government's not going to stop you. They, they're not going to regulate you from doing this. You can buy as many lotto tickets as you want. Some of them even encourage it. There was a senator the other day or congressperson the other day on on kind of like one of these meetings they had, encouraging people to buy lottery tickets instead of buying crypto because there's a state tax on it. Like, you know, I don't, I don't see how you can argue that these financial regulations are there to protect the average person when in reality, a lot of them are there just to just to protect the wealthy and to make sure that it's it's a gated system so that you and I, as regular people, can't access this system anymore. Uh, sorry, can't access that system. Whereas crypto does the exact opposite of that and gives everyone access, equal access to everything. Yes, there's insider stuff that goes on in crypto. Yes, there's v uh, insider VC deals and, and funding and all that sort of stuff. But it is a million times better in my mind than the traditional finance system. So again, another point that I really didn't like here. Um, and then he goes on to say, uh, you know, uh, he goes, you know, if you lose your savings account uh, password, it's your fault. If you fall victim to a scam, it's your fault. If billion, if billionaires are manipulating the markets, they're geniuses. Uh, this is the type of dangerous free-for-all capitalism cryptocurrency was unfortunately architected to facilitate since its inception. So essentially what Jackson's saying is that he doesn't want people to have the freedom to do whatever they want. He wants people to be heavily regulated. He wants everything to have like safety nets around it. He wants everyone to kind of, you know, be coddled by the government. This goes very much against what I believe. As, as I said, I'm not like a right-wing person. I know this is, this is the views that the, that the I kind of like the the 
quote unquote right wing people share is that they want less government and things like that. I mean, I, as I said, I don't I don't think I fall into that camp, but I do truly believe that people deserve to have the freedom to do whatever they want, even if I hate it, even if I think it's disgusting, even if it makes me sick, like people creating scams all the time and and scamming the little guy out of things. I still think the net benefit of everyone everyone having the freedom to do whatever they want in the confines of the law, right? This you know, when, when I say whatever they want, I don't mean literally whatever they want without punishment, but I mean simple things like being able to be your own bank. That shouldn't be illegal. It shouldn't be something that should be heavily regulated. You should be able to do what you want with your own money. So, you know, from that point of view, I, I feel like Jackson and I have like completely different politics. I feel like Jackson is someone who believes in lots of government regulation, lots of government in people's lives. And I am like pretty much the opposite of that. And, I, you know, it's funny because I share views from both like the right wing and the left wing. And as I said, I, I consider myself more of a centrist. Um, but like at the core of who I am, regardless of politics, I believe in freedom. That's why I believe in Ethereum. That's why I believe in decentralization. I want everyone to have the freedom to do what they want. I've always... I mean, personally, I've always hated people telling me what to do. I hate the government telling me what to do more than anything. Um, and I hate, you know, the, the the fact that I kind of like have to pay taxes that get wasted on on crappy things and, and kind of like this corruption everywhere and stuff like that. But I mean, I could rant forever about that. Like I'm fine paying taxes, but when you kind of see what happens in governments and how a lot of the stuff going on there is, is it, there's so much corruption and things like that. How can you say that having more government regulation of things would actually benefit this space and, and make things better? All it would do would mean that the government would capture it for themselves and they just protect their wealthy donors. And this is, I don't think this is controversial to say. Like, this is all plain out there. It's transparent as hell. It is not conspiracy theories or anything like that. Um, but anyway, I think I spent a lot of time on this topic. I, want to get, I wanted to get to some more positive things. Um, but yeah, I, I felt like it was important to cover this because people will see this and think that he's making a lot of good points because this is what you do when you want to make something go viral. You keep it simple. You, you, you create things that cause division. You uh, kind of like say things that, on the surface level makes sense, but then when you dive deeper into it, kind of like falls apart completely, but most people won't dive deeper into it. They'll just read the surface level stuff and be like, oh, oh yeah, he made a really good point. Oh, this is, you know, this, this is all the stuff I know of. Like I can relate to this. This is all problems. And it's just, there's no nuance here that just removes all kind of like, uh, I guess, uh, detailed um, analysis of, of the issues and things like that. And I think Jackson is just like, in all honesty, he put this thread together because he's coping. In my mind, I think I feel like he's coping with the fact that he hates crypto and he hates that he had he he made Dogecoin and he hates that he's known for that and he wants to basically um, you know tear it down any way that he can. This thread, as much attention as it got, it is completely inconsequential to the crypto ecosystem. It doesn't even matter in the long run at all. Like no one's going to listen. Like no one's going to not adopt crypto because of Jackson's thread, essentially. But anyway. Leaving it at that, wow, I, I spoke about that for a long time. I just checked the timer there. Uh, maybe this episode's going to be go for quite a while. But anyway, that's my little rant about that thread there. I'm going to leave it at that. Move on to something more positive, which was something that I discussed yesterday, the... Um the Infinite Garden uh, kind of like documentary that uh, that is being created by uh, Linda Shea here and a bunch of other people is now live. So the crowdfund is now live on uh, Mirror. I said to you, I said to you guys yesterday that you could go onto the Mirror platform uh, when it went live and you could contribute. And you can actually, this is like as I said, a crowdfunded documentary. You can contribute here. And as I said, I feel like the funding goal was going to be reached pretty quickly. There's already six hundred fourteen thousand uh, dollars pledged here. Pledged here. And you can go on the leaderboard as well. I mean, currently the leaders uh, donated 22 ETH here at, uh, at number one, and they're going to get unique NFTs for contributing and also be named as executive producers. But there's different reward tiers as well. Like if you don't want to donate that much money, of course, and you can read through all the, the details on the mirror post here. I, I'm really excited for this. This is going to be an awesome documentary, I reckon. I mean, Linda's been in the ecosystem for quite a while. I think she definitely knows what she's doing here. Uh, she, and, you know, she's not the only one working on this. There's a bunch of other really awesome people as well. But this is going to be uh, really cool. I think. And it's going to shine a really great light on Ethereum. And who knows, maybe we get it on Netflix. That'd be really cool, right? And you know what's funny? I was actually monitoring this today and I, and I was looking at this and I'm like, you know what? If I put four, like I, I want to be one of the top three, like if I'm being honest, I really want to be one of the top three produ uh, like producers here and, and kind of like get the credits and you know have my name in lights and things like that. But I'm going to, I think I'm going to wait to like the last minute to make sure how much ETH I have to like outbid the top person. Because if I, if I bid like, um, uh, you know, 23 ETH and then someone else buys me, I don't want to get into a bidding war, <laughs> war with someone over this because that's a lot of money. I mean, 22 ETH is, is, is not uh, chump change these days, but I'm definitely going to be contributing a fair amount 
amount to this. I want to see it happen, but I also want to be in the top three at least. So we'll see how that goes. Maybe you you guys will beat me. Maybe that, now that I've leaked the alpha that I'm going to wait until the last minute so that I don't get into a bidding war, maybe someone's going to snipe that and, and kind of like snipe me out of, of first place. But definitely we'll see kind of what happens there. But definitely go check this out. It'll be linked in the YouTube description. Next up, we had Ryan Watkins from Masari who said that, uh, who at least posted this stat that Ethereum in Q2 of 2021 settled $2.5 trillion worth of value. So that's insane. It's absolutely insane, right? I think in 2019, we did just, uh, sorry, 2020, we did just over $1 trillion for the whole year. Now we're doing $2.5 trillion a quarter. Now I know Q2 was big. I know it was the height of the bull market and all that sort of stuff. And we can expect Q, uh, Q3 to probably be lower than that. Um, at least in terms of uh, of uh, transaction settlement volume. But still, look at this growth. I mean, this is an insane amount of growth here over the quarters. In 2019, uh, I mean, Q4 2019, we're only doing $87 billion of transactions. And now, you know, a year and a half later, we're doing $2.5 trillion crazy. And this is going to keep growing, of course. I mean, one day I'm pretty sure we're going to see quadrillions of dollars of transactions being settled on Ethereum um, each year. And Ethereum is just going to become that world sediment layer that we all know uh, know it's going to become. So yeah, really cool to see this. Uh, I think that, um, you know, he says, yeah, Ethereum is on pace to settle, settle $8 trillion in 2021 already, which is just absolutely insane. I mean, this is more than like, uh, I think this is more than PayPal. I don't know about Visa, probably not, but like this is an insane amount of value. And this is going to catch some eye, uh, some eyeballs for sure. So I kind of like teased this the other day that the Ultrasound Money website has put together this kind of, uh, you know, projection uh, supply chart that you can see here. If you scroll down, you can actually play with the staking amount to see what the supply is going to be like, what the base fee is going to be on average. So let's say the base fee is 20 on average. Um, the fee burn a day will be about 2k ETH, ETH burn per day. And when the merge date is going to go through. So let's let's kind of say the merge date is going to be 1st of March 2022. The staked ETH amount at the merge is going to be 10 ETH and the base uh, gas price is going to be about 20 GUE. So the Projected supply will be 119.7 million. I think the current ETH supply, I mean, he'll probably have it here, the current total supply. If I go to the date, uh, what is it? Uh, let me just quickly go to the date here. Um, I always forget what year it is and what date it is. It's July 15th, isn't it? Right. July 15th. Okay. So currently it is about 116.8 million. So we'd only issue about three more, uh, three million more ETH, in, you know, if these assumptions are kind of like in here, which I think is awesome. I mean, you can see here that the proof of stake issuance per day at 10 million ETH staked would only be 1.4K ETH a day. And if we have a base gas price of 20 GUE, we will be burning more than we're issuing per day, which means ETH would be deflationary. This is what we mean by ultrasound money. So definitely go play around with this. I'll link it in the YouTube description. You can play around with your own assumptions. You can say, oh, well, what if we go back to 100 gray average per day? That's a lot of ETH being burned per day. And what if like, I mean, there's even more ETH staked, like 20 million ETH staked, of course, we'd still be deflationary. Look at this. Even, even at... 33 million ETH stake, which is the soft cap right now, we'd only be issuing 2.6K ETH per day. And if we go back to 100 GUE average gas price, which was the norm for many months over the bull market, we would be burning almost four times as much as we're issuing. This is ultrasound money, people. Go play around with the, um, the slider yourself and check out kind of the different things going on here. So the official London mainnet announcement coming from the Ethereum Foundation blog has been posted here. This has all the details of all the different clients, where to download them and download the, the client-ready versions for London. So if you run any of these clients, be sure to go download this. It has information about the EIPs included, obviously 1559, but a bunch of the other EIPs, and it has an FAQ. So you can go check that out as well. Uh, it'll be linked in the YouTube description like everything else. ZK Sync's 1.x upgrade is now complete. This is the upgrade that I teased the other day, but essentially uh, Ethereum developers on ZK Sync now have uh, more tools in their toolbox, which is mint, transfer, a swap, and withdraw NFTs are there. ERC20 swaps and limit orders are there, and permissionless token listing is there. Now, how cheap is this? Well, 0x Mons has put together, a, 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 a put together. he just put out a tweet here. He said, minting NFTs costs around 0.0001204 ETH on ZK Sync mainnet, which is only around 25 Five cents at current ETH prices. To mint an NFT on mainnet is at least tens of dollars. So this is a huge improvement in ZK Sync. And I'm pretty sure ZK Sync is going to get even cheaper over time as more people use it. Works kind of like similarly to the other scaling solutions. So that is really awesome. So kudos to ZK Sync for getting this out there. I'm really looking forward to people kind of building on them. Uh, DeFi Pulse kind of announced today that they're going to be issuing another 
uh, index on, on the index co-op called the Pay or the Pulse Aggregate Yield Index, jointly developed by Pulse Inc. and Matthew Graham, who's a core community member or a core contributor at the index co-op. So what Pay is designed to do is it's designed to capture the best risk-adjusted yield on USD stable, stable coins, aggregating yield across DeFi into a single liquid ERC-20 token. So essentially, it's just like a simple token that you hold to get exposure to uh, USD-denominated uh, yield. Now, all the details are, are, are kind of like um, in the, forum post here it's quite lengthy so definitely go check it out if you haven't yet it'll be linked in the youtube description i know i'm powering through all of this sort of stuff but i didn't want to go too long with this with this today but um anyway just go check this out uh, it's definitely interesting uh, the Squanch posted on Twitter yesterday a list of staking pool uh, screw-ups uh, that have happened uh, with ETH2 so I think this is really cool for a number of different reasons. I think monitoring which staking pools have been slashed, which ones have uh, rug pulled, which ones have uh, gone offline for long periods of time, and which ones are just generally not trustworthy to stake with is essentially very important for stakers. Now, I wrote more about this in the Daily Gwen newsletter today. You can go check that out. But the reason why I think it's really important is that a lot of people aren't going to stake on their own. And I'm totally okay with that. But I think that people should really know who they're staking with and really have some idea of who to trust and and where their funds are going to be relatively safe because we don't want people just like staking on exchanges like Coinbase and, and Kraken or whatever. We also want them using the different staking service providers. We want to at least distribute that stake out uh, to kind of like all these providers and make sure that they're secure and that they aren't going to rug pull and that they're they're actually legit and all these sorts of things. So uh, the Squanch kind of like tracking it here, I think is very important uh, for, for kind of like making sure that you use the right staking service provider if you, that's what you, want to, what you want to do because maybe you don't have the minimum 32 ETH or you don't have the infrastructure to be able to stake on your own so definitely go check this out i mean he kind of like has all, all of them listed here there's not many too far which is good but he has links to what happened with a lot of them and, and which ones got slashed and kind of like which ones rug pulled as well so you probably heard about some of them already but anyway you can go check this out bookmark it come back to it from time to time i think it's a great resource so MetaMask uh, did their first EIP-1559 compatible transaction today on, uh, I think it was on Testnet, obviously the Robston Testnet. I like this little meme that they did where they said, it's not about money, it's about improved UX. And they have a picture of the Joker burning all the money, of course. As you can see the uh, the MetaMask transaction here from the mobile client um, on Robston, which is an EIP-1559 transaction. You can see here, transaction type, EIP-1559, max fee per gas, max priority fee per gas, transaction savings, all that good stuff here. Um, so th yeah, that's really, really cool to see that, that MetaMask has that finally, uh, sorry, has that done there. And I think, you know, two weeks away from 1559, we're going to be seeing plenty of people doing this. It's going to be awesome. I've spoken about 1559 enough. I'm going to move on. Um, Block Native announced yesterday that they have raised $12 million in a new Series A round. Now, disclosure, I am an advisor to Block Native, uh, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there. I've spoken about them a few times on the refill before. Uh, what Block Native is, is basically a mempool infrastructure kind of, I guess, um, a, a company, I guess a company building mempool infrastructure. Uh, they've got a bunch of different products out there right now that different uh, various people use developers traders individuals all that sorts of sort of stuff going on you can check out their products here i mean they've got like the mempool explorer which is basically a live view of the ethereum mempool the simulation platform which basically allows you to simulate transactions uh gas platform and gas estimator pretty self-explanatory and they have a bunch of different things for developers like an api api and sdk uh the round 12 million dollar round was uh led by I think it was uh, led by here, uh, Row Capital, uh, Row Capital's Ignition Fund, and there was a bunch of other kind of like funds that, that participated, like Robot Ventures, which is Robert Leshner's fund. Uh, you had angels such as Kane Warwick and, and Ryan Sean Adams and David Hoffman, Stani, uh, and then existing investors. Uh, uh, these, these are the existing investors that Block Native already has, like Coinbase Ventures and IDEO Colab Ventures and things like that. So, congrats to Block Native on the raise. Of course, this is this was uh, this was really cool. Twelve million dollars, obviously a lot of money to, to to scale the team out, keep the team go, keep the team building and going. I think they're building a lot of good products for the ecosystem. I mean, that's why I'm an advisor to them. I was uh, honored to join because I think what they're building is critical backend infrastructure that a lot of people are going to uh, are getting a lot of value out of, uh, and they're growing really fast as well. So, I mean, if you're a developer or you have any uses for their for their products or you want to see what kind of like the use cases are for different kind of people in the ecosystem you can go check out their kind of like website for it they've got different links here as i as i just showing here on the screen use cases for traders they've got like different examples here of what you can do um and, and all that sort of stuff and you can get in contact with them for more info and all that sort of stuff so definitely go check this out if you haven't yet uh and congrats again to block Natty for the raise 
So OKX is now supporting Polygon mainnet deposits and withdrawals. This was really, really cool to see. Obviously, uh, P Polygon has support from a bunch of exchanges now. I spoke about Coinbase uh, mobile wallet um, supporting it yesterday. This is great for onboarding, of course, and getting more people onto Polygon without having to go through bridges and things like that. So just really great to see OKX supporting them. Uh, they're going to be supporting Arbitrum as well from memory, and I'm sure they're going to add support for Optimism and, and basically every solution. I expect all of these centralized providers to support most of the scaling solutions out there on Ethereum. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of them going live. So speaking of scaling solutions, the I guess the one I spoke about yesterday on the refuel, or maybe the day before, I can't remember, was Optimism because Uniswap launched on there. And I spoke about this uh, notion of a sequencer. So, uh, you know, I didn't really describe what a sequencer was, but they're essentially the block producers on Layer 2s. Um, but Chris here, the creator of L2Beat.com, which is a website that tracks L2 traction and, and different information about L2, put together this really detailed thread on what sequencers are and if they are a threat to decentralization and how they can be de decentralized out further, all that sort of stuff. It's a really, really educational thread. I highly recommend going and giving it a read. It will be linked in the YouTube description, but I'm not gonna read out the whole thread here. I just wanted to kind of highlight that. Uh, and finally, we have Stani saying that the new version of Aave protocol is in order. As I said to you guys uh, multiple times on the refuel, Aave loves to tease things. And they've been teasing stuff for, for a while now. And now we have confirmation that they're coming out with a new version of Aave protocol and it is in audit, which means that it's very, very close to coming out. So this is really cool. I, I mean, Aave is a, a DeFi darling. I mean, you know, the, the, from not just, um, I guess, their existing kind of products, but what they have in the pipeline and and all the stuff that they've, they're kind of like working on is just amazing. So really great to see that they're just um, building away no matter what the market does, right? Like these builders just build regardless. So cool to see that. But I'm going to end it there. I actually only went to 30 minutes. That's good. Anyway, thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give that video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the newsletter. Join the Discord channel. And I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.